Hello, Pathlight 55 and people on YouTube or wherever you may be viewing this. Welcome to this latest chat with a special guest on Pathlight 55. Tonight we've got Mary Burton, who is going to be talking about her battle with anorexia, which is a very serious eating disorder. Uh, There's a lot of misconceptions around it, perhaps a lot of stigma around eating disorders, and, and perhaps a lot of people uh, don't understand what they are, where they come from, how they can affect people. So hopefully we can put some of that right tonight, certainly with Mary's personal experience of what she's been through. She's very courageously going to share uh, as much of her journey as she's happy to do so. And uh, if you have any questions as we go through, then feel free to pop them in the comments. Uh, now, if you want us to know who you are whilst you're making your comments, there's a little link there that's just got scrolling around the bottom of the screen, streamyard.com slash Facebook. Uh, if you just go there quickly now and uh, click a button, it will give StreamYard, this software that I use, permission to use your name and your little profile picture. So we'll know who you are whilst you're commenting. If you don't want to do that, you want to remain anonymous to us in the studio, that's fine. Uh, not a problem at all. So yeah, any questions as we go along, just pop them in the comments box. And as usual, I'm going to do my sales thing. So if you're enjoying Pathlight Thrive Hive, if you're feeling you're getting some benefit from it, then perhaps you would like to make some kind of contribution so it becomes more sustainable. Um, so if you can go to, oh, you know, I've got the wrong thing here, haven't I? I don't know, tired today. That's what I meant to put up buymeacoffee.com slash thrivehive. If you're enjoying it, if you're getting some benefits, you can do two things. You can either become a member for £7 a month and you get various benefits from doing that, which are all laid out on that website there. Or you can just donate £3 or any uh, combination of £3, any multiple of £3, uh, any time you want without having to subscribe on a monthly basis. So, for example, if you learn something tonight and you enjoy it, you might think, I'm going to give Paul three pounds. You can go to buy me a coffee and do it there. Thank you to all the people who've already done so and uh, the people who have become members. It's much appreciated. And the other thing that I already shared the link for is if you want to invite people in, then please do so. I've had a couple of people messaging me over the past week saying, is it OK to invite my friend in? Yes, it is. You don't need permission. Just invite anyone else you want in. Share the group with your Facebook buddies, with your LinkedIn, Instagram, whoever just Share it far, far and wide uh, because, uh, yeah, the more the merrier. And if people get benefit from it, great. All come in as long as uh, they accept the rules and keep it a nice safe space. So that's all I need to say now. So we'll bring Mary into the studio. And like I say, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the comments as we go. So welcome to Pathlight Tri-Fi, Mary, and thank you for being here. <laughs> so first question is... As I've primed you already, what, what do you love, Mary? What are your passions? I feel like I have quite a few. Like, I've always been very arty, so anything I do tends to revolve around, like, drawing or things like singing, dancing. I Like, I've just restarted ballet, for example. Um, and so I've always done those things since I was little. So it's like, um, they're the things that I love doing. And um, I think that's kind of why... I ended up making my own little like business and stuff um, with like, the illustration because it's kind of the thing that I enjoy the most. Um, so yeah, I guess they're the things that I really love. Mm, so creativity. Um, what, what is it, if I can dig a bit further, what is it about those creative things like the dance and the, the artwork? What, what does that do for you? I think it kind of, when you're dancing, you can't really think about anything else. Like you're having to focus. So it's kind of, it takes your mind off of the things, um, which is like really important to me, um, especially when I was like going through a really hard time. Um, things like singing are things that I can do that they weren't really physically exhausting. I mean, dancing obviously is kind of a little bit, that became a bit tricky, but with the singing, you can, you can sing about anything, like anywhere. And it's like, you know, so I think that's why singing means so much to me and always has done because it kind of allows you to express yourself um, <laughs> so yeah mm -hmm. so creative expression it's very important I think to 
retain some some kind of creative expression and like you say it's perhaps it's a, a mindfulness thing like when you're dancing you can't think of anything else so no. it's it's almost like a meditation itself perhaps yeah <laughs> great stuff okay and i was in the habit of asking people how has lockdown been for you and we're not really in lockdown anymore but i wonder if you want to share anything around how the pandemic in general has has affected you how has it been for you i think it's been really hard like especially at the start when we kind of got thrown into it i was like oh god i don't really know what to do because i've kind of spent a long time kind of going outside to kind of escape what was going on in my head so now I wasn't really allowed to go out that much and I felt a little bit trapped. Um, so at the start, I found it extremely difficult. Um, then we kind of got into like the middle of it and I was kind of like, okay, I'm starting to get used to this a little bit now. This is kind of the new normal. Um, but then we came out of it a little bit more and then I started to struggle again because it's constant change and no one really knows what's happening. And I'm like the worst with change. so. As that was like carrying on happening it just got harder and harder um i think now i might have settled out a little bit because it seems to be a little bit more consistently normal but um yeah definitely at the start it definitely kind of shook my world a little bit um and it definitely tested um how my brain was processing things because i didn't really have much distraction um so yeah hmm. yeah it's good awareness that it's how it impacts your your mental well-being and the restrictions and the uncertainty is a big one isn't it for yeah. a lot of people mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, show me someone who's good at change i don't know who's i don't think yeah. i've ever met anyone who actually loves change it's hard yeah it really is yeah it's mm. one of the hard things yeah great thanks for that so we're here really to talk about eating disorders and in particular your experience around anorexia so you've already touched on some um, mental challenges, if I can phrase them that way. And so I wonder if you just want to, however you want to introduce it, if you want to go back to the beginning or just talk about what your experience was of uh, anorexia. Yeah, I mean, it's such like a, it's kind of gone over quite a few years and it's kind of hard when like people say, oh, you know, when did it start? I don't really know because I think it was one of those things that, trickled in slowly and I started I started off really um going through phases and it kind of took over very very gradually um it kind of it makes itself not very noticeable um and I think that's kind of how it tricks you a little bit it kind of eases its way in um and it got I mean the worst point was kind of the October just gone you know there's nearly a year now Matt like crazily but um I think that was like the breaking point for me. Um, I tried to recover a few times, but they were they weren't real recovery attempts. They were me trying to manipulate people into thinking I was recovering, um, but I was continuing um, these like really unhealthy habits, um, kind of in the background, and nobody knew. So I got very good at deception. Um, which is something that it really plays with. It makes you, it turns you into a, like a total liar um, and tells you that that's okay. Um, and in the back of my head, probably I knew I was doing something wrong, but the fear, the overriding fear was just so much that it, um, yeah, it caused me to just turn into a totally different person who, to be honest, I don't recognize her at all. Um, she's definitely nothing like the girl I am now um, and so like this year has really been the year of me relearning who I am trying to find things that I enjoy um, and just like mend my relationship with food um, which is really difficult it's like it's something that doesn't like ha happen in like a linear way um, I've definitely found that I've gone through like phases of feeling really great and really empowered and then dropping back down and thinking, I can't do this. This is really hard. Um, but I know that I have come a long way. Um, so I do have a lot of pride for where I've got to. Um, but it's definitely not been an easy journey on any level. Um, and I would never like sugarcoat anything because it's 
like it doesn't the disease doesn't deserve that it's like it's absolutely horrific and i hate it with a passion um so yeah mm, yeah thanks for that i noticed there that you you've called it a disease um you could actually also say it's a mental illness mm. uh, but it is it is a big and very serious thing and a lot of people i think have misconceptions around eating disorders and anorexia and, and think that it might just be around controlling weight or it might just be around wanting to look good or yeah. just just a behavior but it isn't it's it is an illness yeah yeah and i think before i struggled with it if someone had asked me what it was i would have said something completely different to what i would say now like i would have i i didn't know that it was so controlling and that it has it just takes complete power over you um and totally like flipped your personality um and i would have you know probably said oh you know it's people not eating um because they want to be like skinnier or this that and the other and i think that's a concept a lot of people have but it really is like living with another person like inside of your head screaming at you constantly um and the only way to shut it off is to listen to it and because it's kind of gradually forced its way into your life um I think you start to believe it and you start to trust it um it almost like grooms you into listening to it over time um and it really is like it's the worst thing I've been through um but I know that it's something that I can use to help other people um and so you know I I it's kind of weird to say like oh I wouldn't take it back but actually I wouldn't because it wouldn't have made me, you know, I wouldn't be the person I am now. Um, so in some ways I'm quite, you know, I'm like, okay, I've gone through it. It was horrible. It was like horrific, but I can use this to help other people. Um, so in some ways, you know, uh, I wouldn't say I'm grateful for it, but I know that it's um, something I can use to aid other people. And that's something that's quite special to me really. Mm, yeah, it's lovely. It's quite a common. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, there we go, back again. Apologies, Wi-Fi gremlins. I think that was a problem at my end. I do apologise. Uh, yeah, I think what I was saying when we got cut off was that it's a, quite a common story of people who've been through some kind of mental health or traumatic event. Yeah. They have some gratitude to it and perhaps wouldn't swap it because, it, like you say, it shapes who they become. They yeah. learn from it. And from that also they can help other people. So it's it sounds horrible. It sounds incredibly insidious how it gets inside you. Uh, you yeah. said it was another voice in your head just screaming at you. And yet through the recovery process, there are some positives that come out of it. Would that be yeah. fair to say? Yeah, I would say I've definitely grown as a person. Um, it's made me a lot more compassionate to other people. Um, I wouldn't say that I wasn't compassionate before. Um, I think I've just grown to be compassionate in a different way and to kind of understand other people's struggles, um, especially, you know, people who are going through a similar thing. I can understand how they're feeling and I can understand where they're coming from. I mean, everyone's kind of, um, everyone's experience is different and it stems from a different place. Um, so, you know, you can't, really compare like two people even with anorexia because it'll be totally different but um you can understand how it's making them feel in some kind of a way and you have empathy for them mm -hmm. uh, and it has you know um it's brought me closer to a lot of people um and it's shown me really who um who was really there for me and um, there's some people who've just really stuck with me even when i was like 
an absolute nightmare to be around because I was just horrible. Um, and those people stuck with me um, and they never got angry at me. They never um, like ridiculed me for it or tore me apart. They just stayed by my side and like supported me, which is like the most incredible thing. Um, and I'm like so grateful for those people. So, you know, like I've come out of the other side of it really with a lot of people in my life who I care about a lot. So to me, that's something that's really valuable. Hmm. So it's that unconditional love, isn't it? That regardless of what's going on for you and whether it's something inside of you, an illness, a disease, they're sticking with you with that non-judgmental approach. And yeah. I think in, in any form of mental illness, that is a key to recovery. Yeah, it is. Uh, along with that, what, what else? I'll, we'll talk more about how you experience the anorexia shortly, but mm-hmm. as we're talking about recovery now, what's, what other aspects helped you towards recovery other than those people who were there to support you? Ooh. Um, I think I think finding things that you love doing has really helped. Um, it took me a long time because I think at first I kind of thought there's no point in doing anything. I don't have any energy. Um, I was angry. I was very angry, and I was um, I was angry at the world. Really, I didn't I didn't want to be here. I was like, I I don't want to be here. I don't. I've been forced into this recovery, and I don't want it um but it wasn't it's weird because in some ways you could say it wasn't me who was feeling that I was kind of like two people um and it was almost like I was the real me was trying to fight off the the bully that was following me around a little bit um and it's really difficult to um to kind of fight back and so it was a constant like battle between me and the anorexia um, because I did kind of at a point think of it as a friend because it had made itself out to be something that it wasn't. Um, so I guess trying to find things that I could find joy in. Um, I think art at the time was something I could sit and it was quite meditative because I could sit and just really focus on like tiny detailed things and um, and because the things that I draw are very detailed and very kind of small and so it takes like a lot of mental strength and like mental type concentration um so it meant I couldn't really focus on anything else and um the time went super fast and I think that's something that the time that was going by was like me waiting to be told I had to eat again and that was quite stressful so anything I could do to kind of break that time up um, and just forget about it for a little bit. It just kind of silenced the noise. Mm. Um, So I think that sort of thing was really useful. I mean, I wasn't really allowed to walk or anything um, during like the start of my recovery, especially. So um, it was like, I I loved going out on drive, um, like getting in the car, like with my mum and my sister and, Going out for drives with on that sort of thing I love. It's very easy, it's very simple, but it's getting out of the house and um, you know, getting out into the world a little bit more, um, even if you are in the car. Um, and it meant there was some bonding time with my family as well, which was really nice. Um, so I think it is those sorts of things like music, um, like even just silly things like not. As silly as it sounds, it's like, you know, sitting and watching something that you really enjoy um, that can make you laugh, because I think laughter is so important. Like, I've never really realized until recently how much I actually laugh. Um, And it's something that I lost. I totally lost that laughter um, for so many years. I feel like it's all just now coming out. Um, So I'm like constantly laughing. um, And I think that's something that's actually really been quite healing because I just laugh all the time and it's made me like even if I'm not really happy laughing makes me happier um so you know anything that makes me laugh is great so yeah (laughs) great that's lovely to hear and um I can resonate with that myself from having experienced depression in the past 
mm. uh, which I know can go hand in hand with eating yeah. disorders. Yeah. And for me, I just didn't find anything funny anymore. All well, the TV shows and whatever else just wasn't funny. And okay. it was a good sign of recovery when I could watch something again and, and have a good belly laugh. And it does make you feel better, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did you at some point, um, I'm, I'm presuming there was some professional intervention, you, you either sought professional help or were taken to professional help. Do you want to talk around what yeah. happened there? Um, so because of my age, it made it very difficult because, you know, if you're like a child, you can get um, easily put into a unit um, because your parents can still kind of be with you and that sort of thing. Whereas I was an adult, so it was harder. My mum would have had no input whatsoever. And I relied so heavily on my mum that that would have been so difficult for me. And I know that that would have broken me even more. Um and in some ways, it's like it was a very difficult time, especially for my mum. And I know it was very difficult for her to decide what to do. She didn't realise how bad it had got. And it's because I'd hidden it. And that's nobody's fault. Um, but, um, you know, I, I should have been probably in a hospital. Um, I was very, very ill. Um, I did have... Um, a psychologist, a psychotherapist, uh, who I'd still see over Zoom now, <laughs> um, who's really, really great, um, called Ali, and she's, you know, I've been seeing her for years now. Um, and so she was, she's been really useful um, with like, I think it's CBT. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. And um, so that's kind of what we went through. Um, and I just kind of like check in with her now, like every, every week for like 50 minutes. And um, and that's really great because it just gives you like a kind of a place to vent things. And um, even if it's not eating disorder related, anything that could fuel like anything that would be a trigger and um, just getting it out there to someone who understands um, is really, really useful. Um, but it was hard because I was an adult and um, the system would have just taken me and my mum would have had really no say in anything. And because I'm so close to my mum, that would have been really devastating and the state I was in I would have like I would have kicked and screamed and it was I mean the night I collapsed that would have really you know it was make or break and you know it, it happened how it happened but um I guess I'm here um how what we did worked I got into recovery um it was really great in some ways because I was it, it was hard, but I was doing a show at the time. And those people in that show, I will be forever grateful for because they, they in some ways, were a bit like therapy for me. Like going and being with them um, was amazing because they were the most wonderful people. Um, and we could have a laugh and they were so supportive. And going through a really hard time, they were always there to give me a hug or um, ask me if I was okay. And that for me was how I went through the sort of like therapy type thing. I had someone to talk to who was professional. Um, and I did go to the doctors, but the thing is about the doctors, they kind of dismissed me. And that's, that was near the start and that's when it got really bad. So, you know, if I hadn't have been dismissed at the start, who knows if I'd have got as bad, but um, yeah, I did have like professional help, just not as, I guess, intense as it would have been if I was classed as a child, um, which, is, which is quite sad really, because I was an adult in body and an adult in age, but mentally I wasn't, I was more like a child. I relied on my mum like I was a child. Um, which you know I'm starting to come out of. I don't rely on my mum as much, um, but obviously it's a bit of learned behaviour, so it's kind of difficult. Um, but yeah, I guess that kind of a brief summary of it. I guess yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got excellent self awareness, Mary, and um, perhaps a, a sense of space, a sense of distance from it now. So yeah. I think you said yeah. it's it's nearly a year. It'll be a year next month for when you kind of 
would you say that's when your recovery started or when you, your worst point was last October? Yeah, so it's like I collapsed and like, I can't really remember what it was. I I'd had my birthday and um, I had my party and after that, um, I I went to the shower. It just happened to be that I'd gone to have a shower because I felt so sick and I felt so ill and I knew I couldn't really go to sleep yet. Um, so I slept through from the day and stuff. Um, and so I went upstairs and the shower was too, it was just too warm for the fact that I'd eaten literally nothing um, for a long time. And I, just, I, just, I got out the shower and just hit the floor. Um, it was a miracle in disguise, really, because my mum had and she found me, and my mum had to come and like drag me um into my bedroom and you know like um like almost bundle me up and feed me food um which was it, it's weird to think back on because I'm like that just seems so mental to me now but she was having to you know force food literally down my throat because I was so emaciated and so malnourished and it's when she saw my body she was like oh my gosh how has it got to this um, you know, and I didn't see how bad it was because in my head I saw something totally different. Um, and yeah, that was like October time. Um, I'd say mid, like mid to late October. Um, and that kick started the recovery. And from then on, like my mum was so on it. Like, um, it was amazing to be fair. I literally really couldn't have asked for anything more. I mean, she put up with so much um with me being angry literally kicking and screaming at her not to like when she was trying to feed me I would kick and scream and cry um I you know I tried to hide away um which is just it doesn't feel like me I, I'm like that was me but I don't really um understand that person anymore um but she was incredible um and also so was my sister I mean the fact that she found me um must have been absolutely horrendous and you know having to talk to her about it over time has been quite healing I think for me and hopefully for her too because it's quite traumatic I mean she thought she was going to lose me so um that has been something that actually in some ways has made our bond stronger because we've been able to talk about stuff and um understand each other really so yeah mm. So well done, Mary's mom and Mary's sister. Uh, sounds like they were rocks for you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, gosh. So it sounds like from what you were saying there, Mary, that it was a big shock to your mum, uh, the, the, the state that you got in, you were so emaciated. So mm -hmm. would you say that you had um, consciously taken steps to, to hide your anorexia and hide your body at that point, up, to, up until that point? Yeah, so, um, I mean, in the weeks upcoming to it, um, I was obviously rehearsing for this show, and I remember saying to the, you know, the director and whatever, I was like, oh, I can't do this dance, um, I because my knees and everything were so bony, um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't kneel on the floor, I, I couldn't, I didn't have the energy to go down onto the floor and get back up again, um, and so I was like, I can't do this. Um, but I just had to say, you know, oh, I think, you know, my knees aren't built for this. Um, but in reality, it was because I was, you know, so far um, embroiled in this illness. But, um, yeah, I... <sighs> I've forgotten the question now. That's really cool. <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> uh, it's, around, uh, it's OK, it's OK. Uh, <laughs> it's around uh, whether you were consciously hiding your yeah. behaviours and the illness on your body. Yeah, so yeah, I was, um, and I think I made excuses for things um, because it was almost feeding me ideas. It was saying, you know, do this, do that. People won't be suspicious. Um, so I wore a lot of big kind of um, loose-fitting dresses and um, that sort of thing. Um, I think I, I don't know, really. I wore jogging bottoms a lot. Um but I still felt like I'm not bad enough, I'm not bad enough. Um, 
which looking back, seeing pictures, I'm like, how did you not see what was going on? Um, but my brain was so fried and so like totally just gone that I couldn't see the reality um, which is part of like, you know, the body dysmorphia, um, which I still struggle with, but having a healthy brain, um, having energy and fuel really, um, really makes a difference because your brain can function to a way better degree than it ever could when I was living off the bare minimum. Um, and I wouldn't even say living, I would just say existing, really. I wasn't, I didn't have any life. Um, I was trying to pretend I did. And I did, you know, um, try, I did a lot of sneaky things <laughs> uh, that I'm really not proud of. Um, but I know that I had to do a lot of work on saying, okay, Mary, it wasn't you. It was you and you can't um, blame yourself. It's not your fault you're not to blame for this, that you shouldn't have any shame around it. Cause I did have a lot of shame um, around the things that I did, the things that I said, um, the ways that I punished myself um, I wouldn't wish upon anybody. So, you know, um, it makes you very deceptive and that's so not me. Um, I'm like such an open book. I would say that it was like, it just changed me totally. Um, and so yeah, I, I did actually go out and like buy clothes that were just like that would just drown me. Um, and I would I hated clothes shopping actually because I I didn't want to feel like oh I bought a small size and it feels kind of like too feel like oh maybe a bit small, which in reality it didn't um, because everything hung off me. I was literally just so. Um, yeah, it's amazing to think back actually on how twisted my mindset was, really. Mm. So it is that mental distortion that is very much part of the illness, isn't it? And yeah. I've been struck by by how you've been characterising it, Mary, as, as something apart from you, which oh, yeah. I, I really like. And I think, again, trying to generalise this into other mental illnesses, I like it when people say, uh, yes, when when the the anxiety is here or the depression is here, um, it's it isn't part of you. It, it's a transient period of experience of something you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. so it's I suppose it's a bit like externalizing. And I wonder if you kind of saw your anxiety, uh, sorry, your anorexia as a, a little beast, a monster. Whether you gave it a name or anything like that. Yeah, it, it's weird because I, I saw a lot of people online and things, you know, they do kind of give that voice a name. And for me, it was weird. I, I kind of said, I don't want to do that because that gives it more power. I felt like if I gave that thing a name, it gives it an identity and I'm saying that it belongs and that it's valid when it's not. And I didn't want to give it any sort of validation or any power over me. Um, it was, I think when I think about it, I, I think about it as kind of just like a really dark mass in my head. Um, it just kind of, it's like a very dark cloud and it, it really does just like turn your whole life to gray. Um, and I would say that's kind of how I view it. Um, and if I think about it, I can kind of hear the voice. I can still hear the voice that was talking to me. But I'm able now, because my brain is in a better place, to be able to say, actually, you're a liar and I'm not listening. Because um, even now, like before I go and have breakfast, before I, before I go and have lunch, I'll think, um, oh, should I have that? Oh, should I? Mm, um, and how much should I put on? And this sort of thing. Um, and I'll think, no, I'm going to have what I want and I'm going to put on as much as I want because I was not enjoying food and I want to be able to enjoy food. Um, because weirdly enough, I really love food. <laughs> like, you know, it's this weird thing that everyone thinks that people who have eating disorders hate food or, you know, think of it in that way. And actually, before I, um, before I suffered from an eating disorder, I was like, I love food. I loved going out for meals. Um, I loved, like, 
I don't know like the you know chocolate bars those sorts of things anything I was like I loved a big like Sunday dinner um and so all those things that I loved got ripped away from me and I was just left you know just feeling exhausted all the time and in pain and um yeah it totally tore my life apart and I've had to pick up the pieces um but I do think in a lot of ways it has made me stronger um, and able to battle a lot of things that get thrown at me now um and if I can help other people um just by being here and by saying it is possible to get yourself out of it no matter how difficult it like seems then that is so worth it because you know I want other people to be free of this because I it's just the worst thing and I've always said you know if I could take it off somebody else I would I I couldn't bear to see another person go through this um I would rather battle it again for myself than see a friend or anybody go through it because I feel like I I've, I've already done it I I you know I've got through it I can do it again if I had to do it for somebody else which is a weird way of thinking in some ways but I can't, I couldn't bear to see someone else suffer in the way that I know I did. Um, and it, it, it pains me to think about it actually. Um, so yeah. Hmm. So that's the, the resilience that you've built up from coming through that Mary and also the compassion that you said that you've enhanced through this experience. So yeah. It's lovely. We'll talk more about your, your blog a bit later on, but we've had a couple of questions. So uh, the audience doing my work for me tonight. <laughs> I'm not sure who this is, but thank you for the question. So as your illness progressed, did you find it easier or harder to hide? You know, it's weird because as it kind of went on, um, I found it a lot easier to hide things. You know, I, I found ways and I found things that worked. Um, and if I got away with it once, I could get away with it twice. And um, as I got, you know, iller and iller, the voice in my head would get stronger. And it it just totally took over and just said, you can do this because you did it last time. Or, you know, you can hide this because they're not here. Um, and it became easier physically to do those things in some ways because I could, you know, I just went and did it. But also mentally it became less of a, oh, I feel bad because I had no guilt. I didn't feel bad for it. I felt good about it at the time. It gave me a sense of empowerment and a sense of, I mean, sadly enough, I felt like I had something over other people. I was like, well, I can do it and you can't. Um, and it, it made me feel better about myself, um, which is horrific because, you know, my worth shouldn't be tied to whether... I can hide a meal or whether I can skip a meal or any of those things. But um, at the time, everything about myself, my worth was totally um, bound to whether I could control my weight and how much I'd lost and how I looked to other people. Um, or, you know, if I was around other people and they were eating a meal and I was eating nothing, I was like, I, I felt so great because I was like, well, they're eating, they can't control themselves, but here I am. Um, and it's when I think about it, I'm like, it's so selfish and so pernicious because why would you want, like, why would you be saying, oh, well, they're worth less than me because I can do this and they can't? Um, it's really, really twisted the way that it makes you think. Um, but yeah, it definitely got easier to deceive as I went on, like one hundred percent, yeah. All right, thank you for that. And as you were describing that, Mary, I was thinking about addiction. So I don't know if you've experienced addictions yourself or if you know a lot about them. But my understanding of addictions is that quite often people will go to any lengths. Like you say, it's, it's like having another voice in their head, and they will deceive, they will lie, they'll cheat, they'll steal, they do whatever they can. Yeah. Uh, and you know aspects of their character come out which they're not proud of in order to feed the addiction because addiction is a disease as well so yeah. would you say that there's some kind of links there yeah I would say you know it is 
anorexia is in a way you know eating disorders are an addiction you get addicted to the feeling that it gives you a little bit and especially my experience I know that I got addicted to that feeling of pride that I got um and the feeling of like a win every time I did something that was slightly sneaky or that I got away with something um but it's an addiction to you know not eating and it's an addiction to that number I was so tied to the number that I saw on a scale I you know I weighed myself multiple times a day which in you know it, that is so ridiculous your body does this anyways um but I you know it's gone down I thought yeah that's great you know it's gone down um and now I feel better about myself and I was addicted to that almost like a rush um and addicted to listening to the voice um so I would say it's like that and I think a lot of things that tie to it are like OCD which I, I find that I do struggle with a little bit um I've, I've had those sorts of tendencies and it definitely ties into that um and so I would say it's a very addictive illness because it it makes you crave um especially validation you're you're craving validation um which in reality you're never going to get because you think oh well, I'll just lose a little bit more and I'll be skinny enough and people will accept me but it, like there's never skinny enough because the illness isn't wanting you to be skinny it's wanting to kill you um at the end of the day so yeah hmm. so it's a moving target there is no end point that yeah. you reach that way and then you're done and the other thing you mentioned there which struck me was around getting approval from other people from other people so do yeah. you feel that like that was really tied into it it was about being accepted or loved by others or was it more about your own self-esteem or are they both one and the same yeah, i'd say a bit of both like in school i i would say i hated myself i i had no self-love i had no kind of idea about self-worth i thought i was worthless and i thought everybody hated me um it was tied into my anxiety a lot um but yeah i I don't know. I think I think I definitely thought that I needed people to love me and I needed to be accepted. And the only way I could do that was through control. And I could control myself by losing weight. I could control myself by changing my body. Um, you know, it also kind of tied into wearing the right clothes and um, doing my makeup in a certain way, doing my hair. I got obsessed it became an obsession to you know really make myself into something like mold myself into what I thought society wanted me to be um and I just wanted people to tell me I was beautiful and I wanted people to tell me that I was worthwhile and um, because at school I got a lot of um things that told me otherwise um I would say like school for me was very very difficult and um I thought when I got out of school it would get better and actually it got worse before it got better um but yeah there is a lot of me feeling which I still have issues with like feeling like I'm not good enough and that I need to do things to seek people's approval and to get their validation when really you know I am valid because I am here and I am breathing and I am on the planet that that is what makes you valid you're a human being um you've got a heart you've got a soul you're valid um but i think nowadays you know there's so many like external exterior kind of like sources that tell you you need to have a certain body type you need to have um a certain way of being you need to like certain things or look a certain way to be valid or be accepted um when actually all of that is absolute rubbish because you don't have to be anything to be accepted. You just need to be yourself. I like that. You don't need to be anything other than yourself to be accepted. Thank you for that, Mary. And I think it is so much of this is about validation, isn't it? And um, yeah. that external locus of evaluation where you feel that you need others to give you that validation and esteem. And this ties into the question that Karen has asked. Thank you, Karen, for your question and good to have you with us. So do you know if there was a particular trigger 
you said that you're not really sure kind of when it started, uh, but what's, what's your sense of that? I think that it was tied to my self-esteem. I think it was one of these things that I, um, I'm not even sure when I started having issues with how I looked. I think there was a lot of things in lower school where it sounds silly to say in some ways that, you know, like these challenges where, you know, people did hot or not and these sort of stupid, like immature things. Um, and I just remember constantly getting on my Facebook wall, like not, not, not. Um, and like really low numbers for like looks and all this sort of thing, as if that is the thing that matters. Um, and I think over time I took this in con like consciously and thought, oh God, like there's something wrong with me. Um, and it grew and grew and as things got like worse I thought I need to change this and then that's when it's almost like the voice kind of got this little bit of permission to say well I can do something about that I can change you I can make you acceptable um, and so I think the lack of self-esteem coming from just things that happened in my life and things that people have said to me and it up over time and it does wear you down like words have power and I think people underestimate that the things that people say really really do affect people and I really do try and be careful about the things I say now because I know that things I put out there I can't take back once they're out there they're out there um, and it's something that I'm trying to work on saying to myself because you have to say kind things to yourself as well um, because that is very important um but i think that yeah the things that people said things that people did totally triggered this lack of self-worth and this idea that i needed to change and i'd say that those were the things that forced me to want to change myself i think yeah mm -hmm. so yeah i mean you said the silly little things like hot or not but to yeah. me, they're not, it isn't a silly thing. It's it's quite insidious. It's very polarizing and just little comments that people, you know, children can be very cruel. Yeah. Um, in fact, anyone can be cruel, but children, I suppose, don't have that sense of compassion right. uh, and they don't appreciate how, how much impact their words can have, especially if it's towards a sensitive soul, someone who has predispositions mm -hmm. to depression, anxiety, whatever else. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it sounds like a lot of external pressure, and I suppose social yeah. media and and oh. the media in general presenting yeah. issues, uh, sorry, images of very skinny models and such like doesn't help either. No, that that is something that you know I constantly had to go and delete my social media or um, try to stay away from it, or even just unfollow accounts that don't promote, you know, self-love and um, self-worth because there is no point in staring at somebody else and wishing you were them, um, which I've, I've lived my life doing. You know, you flick through and you subconsciously kind of take in all this stuff and in some way it's going in. And I don't want to say, oh, why aren't, why isn't my body like hers um, or anything like that? Because at the end of the day, I can never, no matter what I try, I can't be that person. Um, I am me. And like it or not, I've got to make the best of that, you know, so I've got to learn to love myself. Um, and I think that um, it, it's a difficult thing to do. But no matter what we do, you know, we've all got our own bodies. They're all different. No matter, even if we all, I've, I've said, you know, even if we all ate the same meals, did the same workouts, our bodies would still be different. So there is really no point in trying to spend, waste your time and your energy and your your life, you know, like chasing after something that isn't healthy for you or your body because everyone has a different healthy place. Um, and so it's something that, you know, I'm really trying to work on, you know, staying off social media a little bit more and being more present in my life with the people who love me um so that's really 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 important actually mm. be yourself everyone else is taken yeah, um, exactly. uh, <laughs> that self-compassion as well that we spoke about earlier 
So yes, Karen's saying that makes sense that there was some peer influence actors as a trigger. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Okay, so uh, moving on to the recovery, I suppose um, you've spoken a little bit about the, the low point and some of the things that helped you in the recovery, which was your, your family and reconnecting with stuff that you love, like the ballet and the creative artwork. Yeah. Um, so would you, would you share what recovery means to you? Uh, because, I mean, for, for a lot of people, recovery doesn't necessarily mean getting back to how you were before uh, no. and also what it looks like today so how how you are today with this eating disorder yeah so that's oh there's so much to talk about um i think when i first started recovery i was absolutely petrified so for me it was like oh god what am i doing i, I don't know if i want this oh and um, and so as i got further down the line you know i started to get back to a healthier place and i thought no no, there is a life to be lived here. There is a purpose for me. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm not the same person I was before the ink disorder. Um, but I think, you know, I wouldn't go back to that girl either. I kind of, I praise her for what she did um, and who she was. I, I know that she, I never want to pick her apart and say, how, how could you let yourself get to that state? Or why didn't you take better control of these things? Because that's so unfair. Um, I feel like a lot of people do that. They go back and they look at their past self and they rip themselves apart and they make fun of them. But if that girl was in front of me right now and I said those things to her, she would be absolutely devastated. Um, and I, I actually love that version of myself. She was, you know, she was hurting in so many ways and she didn't get all the love that she deserved from people. Um, and so I look back on that girl and I think she was, you know, I want to love her so that she can finally get the love that she deserved and the kindness and get the words of affirmation that she should have gotten um, because she was hurting and she was in pain. Um, and so I would never ridicule her for anything she did because she was doing what she thought was best at the time. Um, and I think the girl I am now in contrast with that, like, I I still have my struggles um, with, like, self-worth and all that sort of thing. Um, but I think I can see clearer that there is a purpose for me. I think before my eating disorder, I was like, I, I have no idea where I'm going. I feel like I'm just like, what talents have I got? Like, I don't feel, I feel too anxious to do anything. There's nothing I can do. Um, I'm too scared to get a job. I, you know, I don't really have any friends. Um, and then I, I went through recovery and it was horrible in so many ways, but it's brought me to here. And I can say that I have some wonderful friends who I adore greatly. Um, and I, I would actually say that the bond with my family is a lot better than before. Um, I mean, it was obviously very rocky throughout my recovery because, um, I was like up and down and I would shout at things at them and all this sort of thing. But um, I would say now I'm trying to say, okay, it's horrible what you've been through, but that recovery is going to lead you onto the thing that you're going to do. Um, and I think I've kind of said, okay, you need to go out and help people because I never want this recovery or what I went through to be experienced in vain. I don't want to, do it and then go, okay, that's done. Uh, I'm just gonna, you know, move on because I do think in some ways that that would be quite selfish of me. And I, I, I never want to be that kind of person. I want to say, okay, I've been through something. Actually, this has given me a way of going out into the world, helping people and also doing something that gives me joy because helping other people brings me such happiness knowing that I've like even made someone smile um means the world to me um and so I think that it's changed me in that way knowing that my purpose is to help people and I didn't know that before um uh, you know I've always I kind of had these thoughts of like could I do this could I do that Should, like I wanted to be an actress at one point 
uh, like a singer, these sorts of things. And they're great, you know, but I don't think they're my purpose. I think that it's something that I'm meant to do is go out and help people. And this is a way I can do that. So it's been like very rough and very, very difficult and painful and traumatic in some ways. But I know that I can see a future for myself where I can go out and do my little bit of change in the world. And that is kind of, that's just like an amazing thing for me to suddenly realize. Um, and that's only really been quite recent. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I still struggle with things. Um, I definitely still struggle. There's, you know, I get little voices in my head and I'm like, stop. <laughs> Sometimes it can take a grip. If I'm going through a difficult time, if something's happened in my life, that upsets me, it can get louder because it kind of gives it a little bit of a gateway to say, oh, well, I know what will make you feel better. Um, but it's about kind of sitting down and going, no, because remember what you felt like when you were totally emaciated and just, you know, just totally skeletal and miserable. You weren't happy. You were never going to be happy. It was either, you know, you. it was either the choice of I choose to live or I choose to not. And I had to make that choice. And it's, it's probably the most difficult choice of my life was to say, I'm going to choose to fight this every day. And I'm going to choose to, you know, continue my life and find out what I'm meant to do. And it's, I find it absolutely devastating that you know this illness really does have a, like such a high mortality rate it is absolutely devastating that I know that you know I have an experience of this and knowing that people have been that tortured um and haven't been able to get the help and you know that sort of thing I feel like it's my duty to go out there and try and make a difference um and that matters so much to me. If I don't do anything else in the world, I know that I want to be able to go and help people, like just totally give my life to it now um, because that would bring me joy. And if I can even just change one person's life, that would, you know, that would make me feel absolutely amazing. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So you found your purpose. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's great. Um, that's, it's lovely. And you're saying, you know, by speaking about it, by doing your, your blog, which we'll speak about in a minute, and yeah. whatever else you may do in, in advocacy and, and raising awareness, you could change the lives of many people. You could save the lives of many people. And that's really inspiring an empowering message and something good to come out of something really terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I think being able to go out there and try and make a difference, it just, it excites me. Um, and I haven't really felt excitement in such a long time. Um, that thinking, Oh, okay. I can start studying something that it's going to take me a lot of years to be able to get the qualifications, but it's going to be so worth it. And as I go along the journey, I can write my blogs, I can, I want to go and do talks and, um, you know, if I can help in, with any charities, that sort of thing, that's going to build up things that I can then use when I get, you know, the qualifications. Um, because the qualifications, say, you know, they're going to be great, um, but I have so much to offer in the meantime as well. And I know I'm still very young, <laughs> like I, you know, I'm 20, I'm turning 21 in the next month, but um, by the time I've got these qualifications, I'll have lived so much more life that I know I'll have a lot more to offer. But in the meantime, I do want to be able to say, I showed you a bit of lived experience and I want to be able to share that and help people in, you know, the interim, I guess. Mm, and there's so much value in that. And I'm yeah. thinking of, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Sat Satvia, Nija, she's um, she has lived experience of self harm, 
and she does probably a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, Mary, for eating disorders. So I'm kind of characterizing you in my head as the Satvia Nija of eating disorders and, yeah, I'll take that. I'll and take helping that. people. Brilliant. Excellent. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, that's. I find this really inspiring, and um, yeah, it's 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 always beautiful. I think when something traumatic for individuals and families, and I'm sure it's affected a lot of people around you. Yeah. But you've, it sounds like you've come out of it so much stronger, with such more resilience, and knowing who you are, and getting back in contact with the things that you love, and finding your purpose at age twenty. That's you know. Took me more than twice as long as that to find mine. So well yeah. done. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're coming towards the end, I suppose. So is there anything else, Mary, that you'd, you'd like to share before we do close? Oh, there's something I'd like to share. Um, I guess. Oh, I don't know. Um, I think I just want to say that. You know if you're going through a hard time if you're feeling like you're struggling with it it is one of the hardest things i am aware to go and get help for it because i for one you know it took me a long time to get the proper help and to be able to accept that i was ill because i i was in a lot of denial um but you know i i do want people to know that there is the chance there is a way to get better. Um, you know, there are so many people out there who want to support you. There's so many things you can do. Um, I mean, you can get in contact with B. Um, if there's anybody, like if you think a friend is struggling, reach out. Um, it's not always easy because, you know, I if someone had reached out to me, it, it might have been difficult, but I guess kind of trying to support your friends as well. Um, even if they are resistant. I know that, you know, I was very resistant to help, like to help and people even trying to be nice to me. But the people who stuck around, I now, when I'm in this healthy state, I am so grateful for. Um, and they mean a lot to me. Um, but I, you know, I just, I just want people to be able to love themselves and to be able to understand that they are so worthwhile and that they have a purpose on the planet and not to let anybody um, derail you off your path because you have a purpose. It might take you years to find it, um, but you know, in the meanwhile, you are still valid no matter what you're doing um, and you're worthy of being loved no matter what, you know, no matter where you're from, how old you are, you know, your gender, anything, you are, totally worthwhile as you are and you don't have to change anything about yourself no matter what social media people around you even try and tell you that's a lovely message to end on thank you mary <laughs> yes you are here you are breathing you therefore have worth exactly yeah <laughs> yes so do do seek professional help if you or any loved ones are experiencing an eating disorder or even if you suspect it might be an eating disorder um, and BEAT is a really good organisation. It's a charity, I believe. Um, it's got lots of great resources as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so your blog is lovefrommary.co.uk. Do you want to say a little bit about what, what you use the blog for, Mary? Yeah, so basically I started my blog during lockdown because I was totally just like bored out of my mind for one. Um, and I started having all these thoughts, like a little monologue in my head of things that I wanted to say. And I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to say these things. And I thought, I know, I'll start a blog. And um, I started, I asked someone for a bit of advice. And um, I started by saying, you know, I'm going to do like deeper talks on like Saturday. And then on Wednesday, I'm going to do like lifestyle kind of stuff. And then, and then I kind of got into this habit of just really writing about very, you know, deep kind of meaningful stuff. And that's kind of what I've stuck with. Um, I'd say, you know, I, I've done like a and a type thing, but I have also written a, a lot of things that I really hope will help people, not just to do with eating disorders. You know, I've written about my journey because um, I think that could be very beneficial. Um, 
but I've also written, you know, things that we all experience like um, jealousy and change and self-worth, things about relationships and that sort of thing. You know, I I live things and I write about them. Um, and I think, you know, when you've read something that someone's experienced, that makes it very real. And if someone's got through it, you think, okay, maybe I can get through it too. Um, and so I hope that seeing that I have overcome things and that I've gone through things and come out the other side, I really hope that that can benefit people. And that's what it's there for, really. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So, yeah, making making something good out of something horrendous. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I've got to thank you, Mary. And <laughs> lovely words to end this on. I think that's before I asked you about the blog. So, yes, you're here, you're breathing, therefore you have worth. That's lovely words to end on. So, uh, yeah, all that remains is to say thank you very much, Mary, for your time and really eloquently and openly and uh, with great self-awareness sharing your journey and uh, really inspired by what you're doing, what you've become and finding yeah. your purpose and, and wanting to help others. So long may that continue and thank you very much. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it actually. It's been really good to be able to talk about it and hopefully people will see it and um, it will help somebody. I hope so anyways. <laughs> Yes, I hope so too. I think with, with all of these difficulties, mental health issues, addictions, everything else, talking yeah. about it breaks the stigma, raises awareness and supports people. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah, great. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm just going to very quickly say um, to folks at home, if you're enjoying The Hive, then please do share it. Uh, if you've got anyone who you think would benefit from this talk or anything else that goes on in here, then feel free to invite people in um, or just share share the group widely. And if you would like to contribute to what goes on here, then you can do so at buymeacoffee.com slash Thrive Hive. Uh, many thanks for being here and your interactions and thanks to everyone who supported the Hive already. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks again then, Mary. Take care of yourself and hopefully see you soon. <laughs> Bye. Bye.